Hello and welcome back to Women's Cricket Chat. We hope you've missed us. It's been a while, but we have an absolute stellar guest to kick off the season. Myself, Georgie and Alex are very happy to say we are joined by the wonderful Ellie Throckeld. Hello to you. Hello, guys. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. No, absolutely buzzing. I feel like it's one of those ones we've been trying to sort for a long time and you cricketers are just very, very busy while the rest of us are just sat on the floor in their living rooms as anyone watching on the video can probably see. But yeah, season's over for you now. And um, what a fine, mighty fine end to the season it was for you. I mean, how did it feel to finish off the season with a century? Yeah, it was it was pretty special, to be honest. I think um, more so getting... Getting a win for Shorzy's final game, I think that was something that obviously was motivating us all. Um, but yeah, to contribute and to, to hit my first 100 at Old Trafford was uh, was pretty special. And what was it that clicked that day? Because it just looked like you were just seeing it like a beach ball and just loving life. Or was it sort of end of season, right, you know, this is the one now? Um, yeah, I don't know, really. I think I've felt pretty good with the bat for a couple of months. I just feel like, um, yeah, just not quite got going in some games and... Um, yeah, the seasons felt quite bitty and a little bit of like obviously a lot of rain around and just felt like I've struggled to personally just get going and get a bit of momentum really. So um, yeah, it felt like almost a long time coming. I feel like I've worked really hard on my batting. Um, but yeah, to, to do it in the final game was, was pretty special. But now I just wanted the season to carry on and didn't want it to finish. So um, yeah, it was bittersweet really. And rain in Manchester, what are you on about? Never. I know honestly I didn't play a game of cricket for a whole month so like July was just rained off so um, that's the first time I've ever experienced that in a, in a cricket season but yeah it's mad. And obviously with the weather being such a factor when you play cricket how hard is it for you or how difficult do you find it when you have those periods of time where it you know chucks it down with rain for a month and then all of a sudden we've got glorious sunshine and then you're sort of having to get back into that mode of I've got to, I've got to score some runs. I've got to take some catches down the leg side. You know all that fun stuff as a wicketkeeper. Yeah, I think it's it's tough to be honest. I think um, we just spoke a lot about trying to make the best out of bad situations. So when it's raining, like yes, we might be indoors, but um, can we use that time to get better as cricketers and um, and then use yeah use that time well. And then when when we need to be ready, we are ready. Um, and yeah, I guess the other side of it's just making sure your mindset's right when you need to be on your own, and then. Um, when you are off, you can relax and do what you want, really. And you mentioned this being quite a bitty season. It's also been quite an up and down season for Thunder as well, hasn't it? Obviously, a while to get that Hey Ho Flint win, but may just got yourselves to that eliminator in the Charlotte Edwards Cup. So can you sum up this season for us? Yeah, I always joke about riding the wave and goodness me, it's been a big wave this summer. But um, yeah, I think... We obviously struggled at the, at the beginning and didn't quite get going for a while. Um, and I remember sitting down with Shorzy actually and being like, we're not going to win a game of cricket all year. Like i would literally felt really low myself. I think the group felt pretty low. Um, and I remember, yes, yeah, sitting with Shorzy and being like, how are we going to turn this around? And I think it's probably a testament to the people in the dressing room and the fact that we've got good people with good attitudes that we were able to do that really. And I think, um, yeah, once we got that first win, things just started to click and, we went on a bit of a run and I think people often talk about how important momentum can be in cricket. And I think that just showed, to be honest, that it was pretty important. And um, yeah, obviously the, the mood of the camp changed drastically. And um, we all of a sudden we were sat at Worcester at a finals day, first ever finals day. And it was like a few people were like, how have we got here? So um, yeah, no, I think it was brilliant that we turned the season around, showed a lot of character, a lot of resilience. Um and yeah, obviously to sort of lead the team at the first finals day, like personally, was pretty special as well. I think I've never been involved in one and to, to be involved in one as captain, um, yeah, felt like I'd made a bit, a bit of an impact on the group as well, which was nice. Um, and we came pretty close to Vipers in the semi as well, which was which was good. I think shows that we're competing against the bigger teams. Um, and then, yeah, obviously didn't finish quite as strong either in, in the 50 over comp, but I think... Um, the story of our seasons basically we're not doing our skills for long enough in 50 over cricket really so I guess the team's really young got loads of potential and we've showed really like good glimpses of some really good cricket we just need to do it for longer so I think that's definitely something we'll try and take into next year and work hard on over the winter. And obviously being captain when you do have those low moments how do you mo motivate the team and make sure they are performing to their best? 
Um, I think it's just doing everything I can in my control, really. So I think, um, obviously, I was feeling pretty down, but I would never let that show to the group. And I think every day I came in with a smile on my face and um, was checking in on everybody else, making sure everyone was all right and trying to bring as much energy and like positivity to the group as, as I possibly could, really. Um, which, yeah, it's not always easy when you're not feeling in that place yourself. And um, I guess when you're not performing yourself as well, it's pretty difficult to to lead the group and that's something I've definitely had my challenges with um but yeah it's almost like putting on a bit of a front in front of the girls really and making sure that they're okay and yeah like I said just bringing as much energy and positivity to the group and and leading by example in what I do really and on that role as the captain what was it like when you were named as captain because you are still a very young player you know you mentioned that you've got a young team as well but that must have been a pretty cool moment for you yeah it definitely was I think it's something I've always sort of like dreamed of doing and I, I just didn't realize well I didn't expect to be doing it so young really I think um I got told a couple of weeks before the start of the season the first year I did it um so it was all a little bit of a a shock and something I wasn't really prepared for but I think actually that did me did me the world of good I think I didn't overthink anything. I just got stuck in and almost learned on the job in that first summer. Um, learned a lot tactically. And then I think, yeah, it was then, it was quite a cool time to take over as well. I think with a young young team and a young squad, I think I could sort of take it the way I wanted it to, to go. And I think Shawsy was quite keen on that as well, that I had a big input and um, yeah, he wanted me to drive the group as well. So yeah, it was a great time to take over. And I think this year I've definitely found my feet a little bit more and, um, not just from a tactical point of view, but personally, I can see how much I've grown into the role and um, all the challenges from that first year. I think I've definitely got better. Um, and I think that's probably testament to being like open-minded and willing to learn, really. I think that's like um, something I said from the beginning, like I'm a young captain, I'm not, I'm not going to know everything and I'm going to get things wrong, but um, I'm going to sort of, I'm not scared to lose, but I'm going to do everything we can to win. So yeah, um, I think the sort of honesty and being a bit vulnerable in front of the group with that's really helped me massively. And um, it's not just been me in charge. It's been sort of a, a team effort, really. And yeah, like I said, I've learned a lot and I've still got a long way to go with that. But um, yeah, I'll keep embracing that and keep trying to get better. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, have you sort of found your style of captaining yet? And then also a little sub clause to that one. Do you find it difficult to captain and keep? and bat or at the same time because sometimes they talk about it being harder for the keeper they're having to you're almost running length to go and see the bowler all the time yeah I think I've definitely like found my way of leading now I think at the beginning I was sort of I was looking at sort of the leaders who I think have been influential on me in my life and trying to be like them but actually I think this year I've just tried to be myself and I think that sort of authenticity is massive and um yeah, I've just found my own way of doing things and that's maybe taking the best bits out of everything I've seen from different people and, and adding that to sort of my personality. And um, I think that's working a lot better for me. Um, and yeah, I think we did uh, like a personality profiling thing and that was really helpful for me to sort of get to know myself a bit better, but also to get to know the group better. And um, that was really helpful because I think it sort of highlighted that um, like my biggest strength as a person, which is being pretty people orientated and um, trying to please people and wanting everyone to get along and stuff can actually be my biggest weakness at times. And um, when you're in a leadership role and you're captain, you're going to have to have some honest and tough conversations with people. And that was the bit I found really challenging. And I've sort of navigated my own way of doing that now. And um, so, yeah, that, that sort of get to knowing each other uh, as a group really helped me. Um, and yeah, doing it alongside keeping, I think it, it can be a challenge at times because you are quite far away from the bowler. But I think that's where um, I need to have other good leaders on the pitch. Like it's not just me and um, like having a Naomi Datani at mid on or mid off um, to help the bowlers just as just as good as me doing it, really. Um, and yeah, I think like also you're in a really good position to see see the rest of the pitch. And before I got the captaincy, I was like pretty big on angles and trying to learn like doing that as that role so I think that comes into captaincy massively as well um so yeah and I think just having trust in your own bowlers that they're they're good enough to execute their skills and good enough to execute their own plans so I don't really need to be by the side the whole time and just trust in them really but, but yeah I definitely think it comes with its challenges I don't really switch off for the whole day because I've obviously got to keep captain bat um 
but it's something I've really enjoyed and I think I sort of thrive on the responsibility so yeah I've loved it yeah that kind of leads into my question where I was going to ask being such a young captain have there been times when you've you've obviously led on that to help out with fielding for the bowlers have there been times when you've called on sort of some some of the senior players like your Hartleys before obviously she retired at the end of the 100 and Kate Cross. Have you ever like picked their brains? Obviously not to have the same character as you saw, because like you say, everyone's very different, but just to kind of gauge what they're thinking. Yeah, definitely. I've I've like got so, so much help from so many people. I think one thing I didn't do was pick a vice captain. I think that was my decision, but because I saw so many leadership qualities in a lot of the girls, but in different ways that I knew who I would go to in certain moments. and. Um, yeah, so for example, Dax has had a huge role with that uh, when the ball is at the top of the mark to talk to them. Um, I think obviously the experience of the England girls when they come back in is massive. But again, like they're not around all the time, so I can't rely on that. Um, and I think the staff, like I've got to mention them as well. Like Shaws, he's the leadership guru. He's got his own business in leadership outside of this. And um, he's been a real sort of like mentor to me from sort of like a, more more so from like a, a behavioural point of view and um, a, like co- having conversations with people like that and how I go about leadership. And then um, Paz and Chalky, our two assistant coach, are two of the best cricket brains I've ever known in the game. So I think I've been really lucky with the staff I've got around me as well. And they've been sort of brilliant with me um, in trying to help me develop. And I've got a really good relationship with those. So, yeah, I've got quite a lot of people I can lean on. Um, and, yeah, that's why I didn't pick a vice captain because... There's other players on the pitch as well. Afi Morris, um, Tara Norris, they've played a lot of cricket. They've got a lot of experience and I can sort of lean on them in, in different moments in the game. And talking of Fee Morris, Tara Norris, that's and everyone, they're quite a few play- You had quite a few sort of come in this season. There's a lot of moving around that seemed to happen. How did they all slot into Thunder this year? Because I remember looking at the beginning of the year and like this Thunder team is absolutely stacked. Bat, bowl, keep captain yeah um so they were our three new signings so we had Dax, Fee and Tara um and yeah I think like before the start of the season when we were looking at signing players I think one thing me and Shawsy spoke about was signing really good people um and I think the cricket sort of speaks for itself really three really good cricketers well known around the circuit played a lot of cricket um but actually they're really good people and that made them fit into the group so easily um I lived with Tara Norris at uni for years, so know know her very, very well. Um, didn't really know Dax or Fee too well before the start and just obviously got a great reputation because they're great people. Um, so, yeah, they, they fit in really well. And um, actually, they've added sort of not just cricket experience, but like obviously they're a little bit older as well. So they've really helped with the, the majority of the group as well. Um, and yeah, the, the the girls have absolutely loved having them around, and they've added so much. So um, I think they were obviously three really good signings. So done a good job. Enough about the present. I want to go way back to when you first got into cricket. How did it all start for you? Because I understand you were also keen on football. Yeah. So um, I've got an older brother, and my older brother was gutted when they found out that they, my mum and dad were having a girl, not a boy, because um. He wanted a boy so he could play uh, football and cricket with them. But I think, like, obviously it didn't matter in the end. So, yeah, he's been, like, a huge influence on uh, how I got into both cricket and football. Um, Just grew up copying him, really. Went down to the local club at Rainford, um, near where I live, and sort of just picked a bat up and a ball watching him play. Um, But to be honest, growing up, I was always more football than cricket the whole time. Um, And, yeah, it just so happened that, cricket was going a little bit better for me and sort of in England programmes and stuff growing up so I think with that I then missed a lot of football and was getting sidelined quite a little bit and um, yeah ended up sort of finishing my career at Liverpool with like not really playing and just being on the sidelines a lot of the time and obviously when you're training three times a week to not play it can help you sort of quickly start not enjoying the game so um, yeah I then sort of moved to Wigan Athletic and then my cricket started going a bit more seriously and ended up at Loughborough Uni because um, at that point, cr- women's cricket wasn't professional. So I had to make a decision of what I wanted to do. And I wanted, at this point wanted to play cricket, really. So went to Loughborough as part of their MCCU programme, which allowed you to sort of train and 
play as a professional cricketer and, and study at the same time. Um, applied for loads of different degrees there because I didn't really know what I wanted to do academically. Just wanted to go to Loughborough, so um, ended up doing a psychology degree there. Oh, um, I'd never... all the best people do psychology degrees, and all the people <laughs> never use them. I mean, you have yours more than I have, but I didn't tell you a thing. Yeah, so I ended up doing that, and I never studied it before in my life, and um, like, yeah, I've ended up using it quite a bit. So I went on to do a sports psych masters. Um, and I'm currently doing my qualification in sport and exercise psychology. So like the stage two with the BPS, which is like loads of applied practice stuff. So well, I am using it sort of alongside. <laughs> um, so I ended up really enjoying it and using it, which was cool. So, um, yeah, unfortunately not allowed to play footy anymore. But um, obviously within that, I think pretty much straight out of uni, I ended up in a professional contract. So the timing of that couldn't have been better, really. Um, and yeah, that's been me ever since, really. So I've been full time since 2020, I think. Um, and yeah, sort of doing some sports psych stuff on the side. And do you ever talk to players that are a bit older and they'd be like, you don't know how hard it's been? You know, you sort of come out of uni, go straight into that pro contract. Do you ever look at them or speak to them and think, wow, they really they have to try and do so many different things at once? Is it sort of like, I'm really lucky in this age or it's more just a celebration of how far the game has come? Um, a little bit of both, to be honest. I think, like, I don't really have those conversations, but I think I was um, playing, like, open-age cricket for Lancashire women from a really young age, so I have sort of seen both sides of it. I think um, I was lucky enough to obviously, yeah, come out of union to a pro contract, which wasn't around for them, but I've also, I was around a little bit in the days when that wasn't a thing and um, there was no training and you were just expected to turn up and play for Lancashire on a random Sunday and do well. And it was like, I've been around in those days where there was literally no programme at all. So um, yeah, times have changed really, really quickly. Um, and yeah, I guess it's probably going to keep going that way, which is really exciting. And I, uh, yeah, I just feel pretty like fortunate and unlucky to be where I am now, really. And Alex sent me this video earlier. So do you ever, have you ever looked at that England Euros winning thing and be like, wow, I wonder if I'd stuck with football or are you, you're pretty happy with your cricket these days? Um, yeah, I'm definitely really happy with my cricket. I think, um, like, I always believe, like, everything happens for a reason and stuff like that. And um, I do miss playing football a little bit. Um, but, yeah, like, I've had, already I've had a pretty special career with loads of opportunities of to travel the world and um, to play alongside and meet some incredible people within cricket. So I wouldn't change it for the world. But I think, um, yeah, I obviously do miss football a little bit. Um, I asked actually asked could I play a couple of games in the off season, and um, I just got shot down straight away. Our physio was like, "Ellie, would you see Kitten Jennings go to play football in the off season?" And I was like, "No, probably not. Sorry." <laughs> and you know who ruined all that for everyone was when all the England men used to get injured warming up playing football before all their games, and it used to happen so often. It'd be like, "Oh, he's not playing. He got injured playing football in the warm up." It's because boys all think they're really, really good at football, so then they all got too into it. That's my theory. We can blame them. But on the cricket side of things, have you always been a keeper or where did that come from? Um, I actually used to bowl. So I used to like um, open the bowl in probably under 11s, 12s, 13s. And then I think maybe at under 14s, I started keeping. Um, and yeah, I did it because we used to go to Malvern College in the summer and um, I used to spend my whole summer holidays there at that age. I used to go with every single age group and spend the whole summer playing there. Um, and the keeper got injured, so I had a little bit of a go and it was all right. But then I think because my brother was always a wicket keeper um, and actually the fact that you were always involved, I just loved it. And I was like, oh, like this is me. Um, so, yeah, after that, really, I just sort of carried on training. And then um, I think it's sort of something I was naturally better at than batting. Um so yeah, like don't get me wrong, I've worked really hard, but I think the the gains were bigger in that um, than if they were my batting. So yeah, I seemed to progress pretty quick, um, and that was then what I was picked for in sort of like England stuff from then onwards, really. And obviously, in that little feature you did with uh, Lauren Hemp, you talked about making the decision to choose between football and cricket, and ultimately deciding to choose cricket how hard of a decision was that I think what our listeners really want to know is how good is a uh, Hempo's batting technique 
<laughs> it was funny actually. We went to Sixers in uh, in Manchester, and um, she put it on like expert, and I couldn't hit the ball. And then she went in, and I didn't realise this at the time. She put it on beginner, and she starts whacking it. So I, I looked rubbish on the video. So it wasn't ideal. But um, yeah, no, it was um, it was a pretty tough decision to leave Liverpool. Um, I think so. I'd grown up there, played through the whole age groups, and I was uh, in my last year of under 18s at this point. But like. Um, my family are massive Liverpool fans. I've always been a massive Liverpool fan. So to play there as a kid was like so special and it was all I ever wanted to do, really. Um, so to leave there was actually a really tough decision, but I think it, I knew it was the right decision. I think um, so at the end of that year, I'd have either got a reserve contract or I wouldn't. But I think the fact that I'd been on the sidelines most of that year and I'd missed every other weekend with an England camp in Loughborough and I'd missed loads of training. And I just think at that point, my cricket career was doing well. So... Um, I knew that it was the right decision for me to have a future in in one of the sports, but I think yeah, I was I was gutted to to leave um, the club I've I've always grown up and supported and always wanted to play for really. Um, but then I moved to Wigan Athletic and had a couple of seasons there, um, and that was one of the best things I ever did. To be honest, I think they were in a bit of a low league, so it was a slightly more relaxed. Um, didn't train quite as much, and um, would get ninety minutes every weekend when I played. Um, around a really good set of girls and, and great setup and coaching staff and stuff. So um, I started to really enjoy my football again when I moved there um, and had a really good few years there. So um, as much as it was a difficult decision, I think it was definitely the right one. What position were you? Uh, I played centre-half all the way through um, at Liverpool and then when I moved to Wigan, I turned up on the first day and I told him I played on the left wing because I was a bit bored playing in defence and wanted to play a bit higher at the field. And it was really funny, actually, because the head coach there, um, his daughter played at Liverpool with me the whole way through. So he knew who I was and had come and watch me every weekend. And he's like, Ellie, you don't play on the left wing. And I was like, oh, no, he knows who I am. He's like, oh, you play with Lou, uh, my daughter at Liverpool. Like, I come watch you every weekend. And I was like, oh, no. I was like, I'd love to play on the left wing, though, Andy, please. <laughs> That's so funny. I love that you're like, I'm just going to push my luck. And then by chance, you get the one dad that has come to watch every single week. I know. In Paris. I know. Do you find that there's any sort of transferable skills between your football and your cricket? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I mean, firstly, the most obvious one was I was always the fittest in the group, which is a lot of hard work now that I've, I don't just play football and I've actually got to do it myself. Um but yeah, definitely. I think I always say this about kids getting into sport. I think like sport teaches you so much. And I think it doesn't matter what sport you're in, it just teaches you to be a good teammate, um, like hard work, resilience, all of the things that you, you learn through sport. It doesn't matter what sport you play. It teaches you the same things. Um, and I think actually sometimes being in a football dressing room when it's a little bit harsher sometimes and people say how it is and um, it's a little bit of a different environment, I think, it's yeah, it's helped me a lot because I think I'm a lot more sort of yeah resilient and um yeah a bit more mentally tough from that experience. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, like I said, any sport I think it's got key transfer transferable skills and and I think actually I've learned so much from my cricket that if I went and did anything else in life, I think a lot of the stuff I've learned through cricket, especially leadership stuff like that. Um like how to, to be a good person and communicate with people. I think that'll be massive in the rest of my life. So obviously we've seen women's sport, women's cricket, women's football, like we said, all grow massively in the in the last few years. How much have you personally seen that in your experience? And is it something that is actually just really obvious? And where do you think it can go from here? I think, yeah, it's it's weird. Like when you're involved in it, you sort of don't see, you don't see the growth as much because you just sort of, cracking on day to day and I think our part of our job now is to sort of yeah pave the way for the next generation so you're always striving for it to be better but actually when you sit and reflect and look at how far it's come it's it's actually mental like you think even back in the Kia Super League days when for us that was massive because we got paid to play cricket for a month that was like that was huge and now you look now and it's like actually we were only semi-professional for a month now you've got players on full-time contracts you got players playing in the hundred earning a lot of money like the the way the how far it's come now is it's so it's so crazy but I think when you're you're in it and you're wrapped up in it yeah like I said you're always sort of striving for more um and I think yeah it's the same with other sports really I remember going to watch um, Liverpool United women um 
And like, I should follow women's football a lot more than I do. Um, but when I was growing up at Liverpool, we used to go and watch the first team quite a little bit. And like, there was never anyone there. But actually, the other week, I went and watched, uh, yeah, Liverpool United, and they play at uh, Lee Sports Village, which isn't too far from me. And honestly, the stadium was packed. It was like, I've never seen anything like it. Like, it was pretty much a sellout. And um, again, that was something like, I've not followed it for a while, but to think about when I was a kid watching Liverpool women to now, like, honestly, the, like, the, the change is, is drastic. Uh, and it's scary, really. Like, I think the money being thrown around in these franchise tournaments and stuff now for women's cricket, like, I'd love to be a 12-year-old sat, um, or someone starting all stars now because I think the future is just so bright for them. Um, and yeah, it's really exciting, like how far it could go. And you made your senior debut age 14, am I right? And so that's I think so, yeah, long time ago. I think so, just flippantly can't remember. Whatever, made my senior debut like 10 years ago. <laughs> that's already 10 years ago, and you're only 24, so that's insane that you've already got that experience on your belt and there's so much to come in the future. In that time, obviously, you've been part of, like you said, the Kia Super League, but then also seen things like the 100 come around. What has that been like to be part of? Yeah, I think um, I think the Kia Super League actually did quite a bit for women's cricket. I think, like, if you look back now, you probably don't think it did because of all the exciting things that have happened since. But I think at the time, it sort of, uh, bridged a gap between county cricket and international cricket and I think um, at this point yeah county cricket wasn't professional so you were you weren't really training and you just turn up and play um, and then if you were any good you'd play for England so then there was the gap between international and county players was so big that like yeah there was a lot of players in that sort of middle bit that were forgotten about and didn't really they were dominating county cricket but weren't good enough to play for England so I think the KSL was was brilliant for that. Um, and I think the hundreds doing a similar thing now, really, in this country, but on on sort of a bigger scale. Um, and obviously, you're getting the overseas, so you're attracting the best players in the world. Um, and yeah, you're putting it out there for more people to see. I think I was lucky enough to be part of the first ever 100 game, which was the standalone game at the Oval. Um, and I think I'm actually getting goosebumps thinking about it now, but like that game, um, we were on the losing side of the result. But I think that game, I think everyone was literally just taken aback with where women's cricket has got to. I think actually the result that day was obviously, it was important, but also like for us on the pitch, it was like, wow, women's cricket has come such a long way. Like the crowd that day was incredible. Um, and yeah, so like ever since as well, the 100, like it's on TV as the same as the men's game is. Um, it's getting similar audiences now. The crowds are getting bigger each year. Um and it's such a great tournament to be a part of that I think, yeah, it's it's done so much for the game and it's attracting the best players in the world. And I think on the back of the 100, it seems there's more, more and more franchise stuff being able to be played around the world. So, um, yeah, it's been brilliant. Yeah, and I was actually at that first game, so I like to think that I was part of that crowd being all part of it. And you basically in a, essentially just said that cricket is the real winner. We'll go with that one. Um I like that, as yeah. a, especially when you're on the losing side. But you also were part of Manchester Originals again this year, and you got to captain that one for a bit as well, didn't you? When was it when Eccleston got injured? Was there anything different getting to captain something that was even more of a global team? Um, yeah, obviously not ideal circumstances for Eccleston, but I think yeah, to get the chance to captain in the hundred was I think really good for for me and my career and my experience. Um, and something that I was pretty, like, obviously a little bit flustered about because it was very last minute, but quite excited to do. Um, but actually, I think the higher up the level you captain, the easier it gets. I think you to captain players like Amanda Jade Wellington when she comes on to bowl, she knows exactly what she wants to do. She knows exactly what field she's got. She's studied every opposition. She's played against them all around the world. So actually, you just throw her the ball and tell her when to bowl. And it's like, it's it's a lot easier. Um I think we were a brilliant fielding unit as well in the 100, one of the best I've been a part of. So I think um, it was all quite slick in terms of people going where they need to be, best fielders getting in the best positions themselves. Um, so, yeah, maybe a little bit of a difference of being a little bit more sort of self. Um, I don't know, everyone just seemed to, to crack on and do the job, which really helped me out. So I think, yeah, it was actually easier, if anything. But, um, yeah, obviously not ideal circumstances, but it was, it was good to, to get the chance to do that. 
Yeah, so you mentioned the likes of captaining someone like um, Amanda Jade Wellington. Obviously, you've got Dot in as your overseas at Thunder and at the Originals. Would you want to go and join any of these sort of overseas franchises like the likes of heading down under or going to the WPL, getting involved with things like fair break. How much does that appeal to you to be able to just travel around the world playing cricket? Uh, yeah, I'd absolutely love to. I think, um, yeah, it's, that's what I want to do really. I think um, it sounds quite appealing that doesn't it going following the sun and playing a bit of cricket and earning a lot of money. So um, yeah, Obviously, my priorities will always lie with Thunder. Um, still got aspirations to play for England, but I think if opportunities like that came around, I'd obviously, I'd obviously want to do that. And on the topic of England, in 2021, you went down under with the England A team playing England A, Australia A's version of the Ashes. Tell us what that was like and what was it like to play not just one match, but all six? Yeah, it was an incredible experience, really. I think... Um, to go away with the, the England girls as well and to be sort of part of that, you did feel a part of it, which was pretty special. Um, and, yeah, to, to play against Australia, it's sort of like what you dream of doing, really, isn't it? So it was pretty cool to be involved in. Um, and it was a really nice environment to sort of to learn learn from as well. I, I really Things that stand out from that actually weren't the games, but the, the training sessions and um, working with some great coaches and um yeah, obviously it was my first time in Australia as well, so that was pretty cool. Um, and yeah, I ended up staying out there to play a bit of club stuff because I loved it that much. So yeah, it was a great trip. And I guess that's the kind of thing that just fuels that desire to play for England even more. Yeah, definitely. I think um, obviously sort of growing up on England programmes, I think it's something obviously everyone dreams of doing, something I've always dreamed of doing um, and something I'll always probably be working towards. But I also understand that that's going to come from putting in really consistent domestic performances, particularly with the bat for me. So um, I've got a really good understanding that my priorities actually really lie with Thunder because that's what's going to make me play for England. So I think if I just focus on that and focus on sort of, yeah, being really consistent with the bat, I think hopefully one day it'll happen. And you've got a few of the England lot, obviously, in your Thunder setup. Um, we recently had Mahika on the podcast as well. What's it been like to have someone... Firstly, so young, but just so sort of mature head and just natural cricket. What's it like to have her come into the side and be like, wow, these youngsters these days, these youngsters these days, I make myself sound so old. Um, and what's it been like to be able to bring her in and sort of see her just flourish? Yeah, Meeks has been an absolute dream. I think she's such a nice girl. Um, she's actually got no idea how good she is at cricket. Um, and I think it's actually frightening that she has got no idea how good she is and she's that good. So, um, yeah, I think we've only really just seen the beginning from her, really. Um, and, yeah, she's an absolute dream to manage. Lovely girl. Um, like I've never seen anyone want to learn so much. She's just so curious all the time, asking everyone the right questions. Um, and, yeah, she's got a great attitude, so I'm pretty sure she'll uh, have a really good career. We had her at Fairbrook this year. She went up to Hartley being like, you know, I got hit for six, you know, this, that and the other, recovering after that, asking, like you say, always asking to learn something. And she turns to me, she's like, oh, Georgie, I've got something to ask you too. And I was like, oh, guys, like, yeah, the cricket knowledge. She just goes, where do you keep getting your bucket hats from? And I was like, yeah, good. This is where I stand at this kind of level. Literally, whenever I get one, she's like, where is this one from? So if you ever need to get her a birthday present, just get her a funky bucket hat and she'll absolutely love you. That's that's my that's my I love that. Mahika tip. I can't give bowling tips. I definitely can't give those. But there you go. Hopefully I get her in hopefully I get her in Secret Santa then, hey. <laughs> oh yeah, absolute dream. There you go. Sorted. Yeah. Taking all credit for that one. It's all right. Everyone loves a bucket hat, don't they? And I know we've already talked about you scoring a century at the end of the season, Ellie. But were you aware that you and Dax were involved in the highest ever partnership for a batting pair for Thunder? at the time and when these things sort of happen do are you guys aware of these records or do you just kind of go about your business going I'm just gonna bat, I'm just gonna whack at miles today um it wasn't something I was aware of at the time at the time um someone brought it up in the in the dressing room after the game but I think um it was actually really special because like we were talking about how big partnerships are in 50 over cricket and that's actually what we've been lacking with the bat so in the few games we lost back end of the season we'd done the first half really, really well with the ball and then just couldn't put any partnerships together. So I think 
um, for me to sort of sit there and say that in the dressing room and then to go out and be a part of a huge partnership, I think I was pretty pleased from a personal point of view, but also I think, yeah, it's exactly... Um, yeah, to stand up and do it and to have that to the other end as well is such a really good rebuild from us both. I think we were 17 for three at the time um, I went into bat, so we were obviously struggling a little bit and, um, yeah, for Dats to stick around as well and to to sort of pull it back and, and get back into the game from there was a really good effort. And I also wanted to touch a little bit on um, the sort of golf. You know, we've seen a few of the teams, you know, we can't ignore that the Vipers have done the double this year. We kind of ignore them. But the, what there might have been more of a gulf between some of the teams before. Do you think that the regional teams are getting closer all in level and it is sort of anyone's game on anyone's day now? Yeah, I do. I think the reason for that as well is that... Um, the domestic players are getting better and the squad players are getting better. So I think previously teams would have a top five, for example, and if you got through that top five, then you, you're pretty sure you're probably going to win the game or do all right. But I think you're now seeing really, really often batters five, six, seven, eight, who um, are pretty young, to be honest, um, winning games of cricket for the region. And I think that shows how much a full-time programme can can do for for a young cricketer. Um and yeah, you see it with the ball as well. A youngster coming on and and taking poles, which is brilliant. I think it's not just the same names anymore. We're seeing more and more young players come through, um, and different players like sticking the hand up really. Um, other than the likes of probably Georgia Adams, who's had a sensational year. I think like you're seeing loads of different names winning games for the team, and I think that's something I've been really pleased to see at Thunder as well. Like. Um, yeah, we probably could have had a better season, but actually, if you look at who's contributed in the games we've won, it's been different people each time. Um, we've had a few youngsters come through. Liv Bell, our academy spinner, has had a great year. Um, I really like her and her attitude, the way she's gone about her cricket. Um, and and yeah, so that that's really exciting for us as well that we've got we're producing players as well. So I think yeah, the the regional structure is definitely doing doing good things. And obviously, with the announcement yesterday that the ECB are pledging to put more money into women's cricket and the regional setup. You might have even seen Georgie yesterday on Sky Sports discussing it. If not, I'm sure she'll send you a video. But how important is it that women's cricket gets the investment? Because we've seen what it's done for women's football. Like, not not to disrespect the men's football team, but, you know, they've still not won a trophy since 1966. And evidently, the women won the Euros and then they won. They didn't win the World Cup, but they got to the finals. So seeing that investment in the women's football, how important do you think it will be for women's cricket? Yeah, I think it'd be massive. I think like at the minute we're still at a stage where we've not got fully professional squads. And I think like we've still got girls who are working shifts at McDonald's or in petrol stations and then coming to training. And I think to expect to get the best out of that athlete when that's their circumstance is pretty unrealistic, really. Um, and like I've just mentioned about like you seeing the results of full time like training coming off in game. So I think it's a no brainer for me to, to sort of make the the squads fully professional. Um, and yeah, it just allows people to put that more time into the cricket and, and be full time with cricket and not have as much going on. And um, yeah, invest, invest more time and, and, and put all put the role into cricket to try and make a career and I'm aware we don't want to keep you all easy because you you need to pack to go to Ibiza obviously <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to get your Ibiza Crocs packed and your matching outfits <laughs> and all of those kind of things um but I just wanted to touch on Lancashire as a club like the men's alongside the women do a really really good job of aligning the two you know the men's and the women's is that something that they're really committed to because it does come through so well all the stuff on Lanx TV and you know sometimes like we've seen videos of Eccles bowling at the Lancashire men in the nets and that kind of thing how good does it seem to you that they are at sort of aligning the two teams and making them sort of one overarching club yeah it's they've been so brilliant with that I think they're literally doing all they can I can't fault any of their efforts it's been been amazing really I think um, Daniel Gidney, the CEO at Lancashire, is like really, really committed into developing the women's game as well. Um, I think, yeah, Mark Chilton, the director of cricket, has been sort of in and around the Lancashire Academy when a few of us were on the Lancs Academy as girls. Um, so I think he's sort of been invested in the women's game for a long time. Um, and yeah, I think the media team particularly have been unbelievable in sort of making sure we're well covered and um, things are going out on social media all the time and 
the Lanx TV stuff was like our stream is probably the best in the country. Like I think Sky Sports tried to steal it a few times as well, which probably shows the quality of it. Um, so yeah, I think even like the the preseason tours stuff like that, they're literally doing all they can. So I think um, yeah, I couldn't be asking any more of them really. And it's it's I think we're really lucky as a club to to have sort of their backing and their investment. That seems like a pretty nice note to sort of end things there on. Basically, big up blanks. Everyone else should be copying exactly what they're doing. But we always like to round off with just sort of some quick fire questions before, obviously, you go and pack and get yourself ready for Ibiza. Um, so one we like to always go for is what is your favourite item at a traditional cricket tea? I've not had one for years because of COVID. Um I would probably say a prawn mayonnaise sandwich. If they've got prawn mayo sandwiches, it's a posh club and it's a good cricket tea, I reckon. Nice. Good choice, actually. Yeah, I rate that. Rate that. Yeah, we've not had that one. That's such a staple. How have we not had that? Such a staple. Alex? Favourite sledge, either that you've said or someone said to you? Favourite sledge. Do you know what was hilarious? So I was playing, when we played against Storm the other day, um, we literally needed like 12 to win with like five wickets down and um, someone on the boundary so not even in the ring someone on the boundaries counting my dot balls and like it was hilarious because I didn't know whether she was like being serious or not because we were literally about to win the game but um, yeah I think that's quite a good one because it just like properly winds me up when I'm batting but I was laughing. No that's fun I like that. Um Last TV show you binge watched? Uh, I actually recently re-watched Gossip Girl. Oh my god. Um, nice. Yeah, great show. Great show. Easy watching. Don't watch the new ones. They're terrible. Yeah, they don't look brilliant. No, they're terrible. Hours of my life I'm never getting back. <laughs> Go to drink on a night out. Um, water, because I'm an athlete. No, um, probably like like a bottle of Corona or a gin and tonic. Nice. Um, Favourite Disney character? Oh, I'm not a massive Disney fan, to be fair. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'll let you off. It's okay. I think I. I mean, I don't even think he's Disney, but I'm a hundred percent think mine is Shrek. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I can get on board with that. Disney. I just Ted, love, someone once. Okay, someone once told me that I was Princess Fiona, and I they didn't then specify if that was ogre <laughs> Princess Fiona or normal human one. So I'm um, can't decide if they told me I was an ogre or not. But this isn't. <laughs> Um. Yes. Uh, is um. Is Lion King a Disney film? Yes. Yes. Oh, I like the Lion King. I'd be the lion. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, that doesn't really narrow it down for characters. It's quite a lot of lions in there, but you can be them all. <laughs> you can just be all the lions. Um. Tea or coffee? Yeah. Fair. What do you got? Are you like an oat milk? Are you an oat milker? Oat milk latte. Black. Um. I actually drink it black, but partial to an oat flat white as well don't mind don't mind everyone, what is. everyone is aren't they because it's creamier everyone yeah it's quite it's quite mainstream but I, I can get on board with it yeah I'm a black coffee person and everyone's like we can only go here because they do this and I'm like it's it's black coffee wherever it is it's all the same yeah favorite holiday destination the place I've ever been was Melbourne in Australia but I been on quite a few family holidays to Mallorca um and that's probably my favorite place in the world to be fair i know i've just given you three answers but i also really like anglesey in wales oh. um love taking my dog to the beach in anglesey it's probably my favorite nice what's your go-to order when you go for a delivery oh wagamamas yeah everyone i spend the summer dr- eating wagamamas and nando's on delivery nice and what spice level on your nando's medium Okay, that's acceptable. If you get lemon and lemon and herbs, all right. If you're getting plain or like weak, it's not. It's not for you. Don't no, tell me you get plain Georgie. I actually used to find ketchup spicy. So, oh dear. Oh wow. Yeah. yeah. Favorite person you've ever got out or hit for six? Oh, it's quite a tough question that when you don't hit sixes. Uh. <laughs> I remember taking a pretty decent catch when Elise Perry was batting in the hundred. Um, and it's a pretty big wicket in the game, and she's obviously a bit of a goat, so I'll probably say that. Yeah. Um, if not cricket, what would you want to do? Literally any job in the world. You could be the prime minister if you fancied it. Um, I would. I definitely think still sport. I'd want to play footy or something, or 
I always think when I was at Loughborough, I always like really wanted to be a sprinter, but I'm like one of the slowest people in the team. But like if I was quick, I'd like love that. Just like lifting big in the gym and only having to ever run 100 metres. That's I think that's for me. I also think it's because they all have like a real, I don't want to use the word swag, but they do, don't they? They've all got like a real, yeah. and I'm just not that cool, but I think there's something about sprinters as well. Like <laughs> Richardson is so cool, but also terrifying. Yeah. Uh, cats or dogs? Oh, dogs. I was going to have to delete the whole recording otherwise. <laughs> it has a dog. Definitely she has a dogs. pet dog, man. You know what? Yeah. Some people have one dog and like 12 cats. You never know. Cats no, are just, you, just one man. dog. Yeah. I'm not a cat fan. Favourite place you've ever played cricket? Um, India. Ooh, nice. Yeah. And where what would be your dream place to play? Um, I think just because I've not been before, New Zealand. I think it looks beautiful um, and somewhere I've never been, so I'd love to go and play out there. Yeah, nice. And Alex, you got any more? Favourite musician or artist? Oh, good question. Um, I really into Jamie Webster at the minute. He's a scouser. He sings, um, yeah, in a scouse accent and his music's class, so... Um, he's a big Liverpool fan, like sings before Liverpool games and stuff. So give him a listen if you don't know who he is. I don't. Thank me I, later. There you go. Um, what's your cricket it? Uh, keeping in a short sleeve shirt. And oh, actually, I did want to have a. Why the black gloves? I mean, I love the black gloves, but how did that come about? Um, I think so. When the first year of the hundred, I got a black pair because I was like, oh, I'll match the kit, and they went down really well. And then, um. Like they matched our thunder kit as well because it was grey and black. And then when the thunder kit turned red, I was like, "Oh, I've not wore any other colour gloves for three years now. I think this is me. I think I'm a black glove person, so I've just stuck with it." Yeah, well, I'm a big fan. I think they're really cool. So you can. Yeah, you, I think they're you're cool. not going to go red gloves to match the thunder kit then. If I could get a pair of red ones, I'd be all over it. I reckon. I think they'd be cool. How good. Bit um, of a plug. Grey Nichols make some red gloves. Grey Nichols. Ellie Throckgold wants some red gloves, please. Thank <laughs> you. Or literally anyone. Yeah. That would be With New Balance. Send us some some red ones like the Welsh Fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Ones. Come on. All about the ads and sponsors and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, if someone could make red ones, that'd be cool. You could have one of each. Is that a thing? Are you allowed to do that? <laughs> you could have red on the outside and then black there. Yeah, that'd be cool. I wonder if there's a rule about it. For all your marketing needs. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> anyway, we digress. Um, Ellie, before you go, can you please let our listeners know where they can find you on the social medias? Yes. Um, my Instagram is Ellie Threlkeld7, I think. My Twitter is just at Ellie Threlkeld, I think. Um, and yeah, I don't really use Facebook, so that's about it, really. No TikTok? No, I'm not a TikToker. It's not for me, that, I don't think. Just so wait, you're, saying... you're in Ibiza with Capsie and Eccleston. That's going to change. <laughs> yeah, oh. so what you're saying is Eccles has got all the TikToks lined up. I think I feature on her TikTok, but I don't have it myself, which is probably a good thing because I don't really want to see what she keeps videoing me doing. So, <laughs> Well, we won't keep you any longer um, from the draw of your holiday. I hope you don't have to get up <laughs> to fly, but I'm also actually whatever time. I'm very jealous. Um, Ellie Thruggle, thank you so much for joining us on Women's Cricket Chat. It's been absolutely fab having you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. Well, enjoy your holiday, and we'll we'll look forward to seeing what the next season brings. And the red gloves. Thank you.